Philippians chapter 1. And, um, <clears throat> wow, this is, see, this is class 7, and we've covered uh, 11 verses. Oh, it is. It's actually good. <clears throat> but it's not good in the sense that there is a place that I want to go. <clears throat> We're going to begin tonight in uh, verse, uh, uh, verse 12. <clears throat> and um, before we read, I'd just like to say that there is, <clears throat> there is within all of the scriptures we've read so far and everything that we'll read tonight and everything that will be covered up till chapter two, there is <clears throat> um, this, for lack of a better term, this methodology that the Apostle Paul lives by. He, he believes that the Christian life is this. It can be, now here's the problem with these particular scriptures <clears throat> or any particular scriptures, <clears throat> is that when you look at a physical example, you look at an actual example of this reality at work, it can work in a billion different ways. It can manifest in, in tons of different ways with tons of different circumstances and settings. <clears throat> You'll never fully grasp it until you grasp chapter two or rather what the Lord has made known in chapter 2 pertaining to the reality of the cross um, <clears throat> and, I, and I just hate to say that little phrase the, pertaining to the reality of the cross because it is not in the same old fashion <clears throat> and it is clearly I've seen it over and over and we'll see it again here tonight it is this um, way that Paul has chosen to follow and he believes that this is, this is the way of following Christ. <clears throat> I've seen it not just in this book, I've seen it in just about every book in the New Testament, but particularly uh, in the writings of Paul where he is, um, not only set on living this way, he set on, this, this is what he was going to these churches and proclaiming. <laughs> you know, not just Jesus died for your sins. In fact, you'd be hard pressed just to go through Philippians or Colossians or, you know, Jesus died for your sins and now you're not going to go to hell. You'd be hard pressed to find any sort of a major presentation of that as opposed to what you do find him saying, or in contrast to what you do find him saying. I'm not saying by that that you're not saved and not gonna go to hell. <clears throat> I'm saying that I have seen that this man went to these different locations with a view of the cross that molded him and yet molds him and moves him to action and moves him to go and moves him when he goes to speak. All, all of it, all of it wrapped up in this, this same uh, force. Well, you know, we're not yet ready to hit it in chapter two so all we can see is manifestations of it, which is deceptive, not in itself, but in our seeing of it. Because by seeing the manifestation, we say, oh, that's it. See? No, that's a manifestation of it. That's not it. And someone could do that and it not be it. That's the key, is that, um, <clears throat> There is this pattern, there is this order, <clears throat> but it's more than a pattern and an order, of course, that 
Paul sees as the way of victory for him, for everybody he goes to. So let's, let's look at this, beginning in verse 12. And what I'd like to try to do, <clears throat> Lord willing, is get through these next two classes all the way down to verse 20. So let's read from 12 to 20. Um, but I would ye should understand, brethren. <laughs> I mean, anybody already picking up on everything I just said? <laughs> he's, he's going, look, I'm, I'm really wanting you to understand, brethren. He's got something <clears throat> that he, you know, and I, you know, I don't want to regress too much, but I, he's got something that he feels he's talking to brethren, so he knows they're saved. He's talking to brethren, and he knows the kind of relationship that they have with God. And he's, he's dealt with that in verse 2 through 6. But he has come to declare to the church that was birthed out of his reality and not the doctrinal reality, birthed out of it, this church, the church at Philippi, birthed out of this reality, birthed out of him living in accord with that reality, He's come to declare to them, look, if you're going to really find the Lord, if you're really going to find the cross, because we, we call the cross all sorts of stuff, you know. If you're really going to find it, this is it. And he's the apostle to the Philippians. He, now, I don't believe that he's going saying, I'm the apostle to the Philippians. I don't believe that was on his mind at all. He's going like a man with a message, with a reality, obviously greater than a message. You see what I'm saying? He's not going, I'm the apostle to the, you know. He's living by life, and that life is, has birthed them, and now he wants to birth that reality in them and I'm not talking about Jesus saves or Jesus as life as most people understand that. Simply, Jesus as life is in me and therefore I have eternal life and therefore I won't go to hell, I'll go to heaven. But I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me, now what is he talking about here? He's, he's clearly talking about what he's been talking about. The things that happened to him, folks, were imprisonment for the gospel, for others. Imprisonment when he first came to Philippi and was um, one of the main things that happened while he was there, other than, than a prayer meeting he attended. <laughs> This, this prison thing was what happened to him. And he's writing right now in Rome from prison. I think it's in Rome, but anyway, I'm pretty sure. <clears throat> writing from prison anyway, presently, somewhere else. <laughs> so whatever happened then and birthed Philippi, is happening again, and he's with it. He's, he's involved in it. He's, he's, it's become part of him. He's become part of it. And he's trying to explain to some of the early ones that he talked to, this, I want you to understand this, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather into the furtherance of the gospel. <laughs> What things happened to him again? Can I hear it? Prison. Has happened to the furtherance of the gospel. Okay, well, think about it. If you got thrown in prison, would that happen to the furtherance of the gospel? I mean, let's just be honest. Come on. If I got thrown into prison, would that be for the furtherance of the gospel? Well, it really depends, doesn't it? <laughs> But for the most part, most people would not see that as the furtherance of the gospel, would not want it, would not ask for it, would not stand for it, would pray and do everything. And I've got, I'll read some of these things in my notes. Would do everything they could to fight against 
such things, Paul says, these great things, these imprisonments, <laughs> have literally helped and furthered the gospel. Okay? That's verse 12. That's pretty good all by itself, isn't it? But we're going to try to cover seven more verses. <laughs> so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. All right. Now, you could say, well, yeah, they're manifest. Everybody's talking about the fact that you're in prison, dude, for going against Caesar. That is not what he's talking about. And you can find that in some of his other letters. In fact, it might, some of it might even be towards the very end of this one, where he talks about even some of Caesar's household have come to the faith. You know, now you have to get into that picture and think how in the world, I mean, this would prove that Caesar is stronger than Jesus, or Caesar is stronger than Paul, and that Caesar's way is greater than Paul's way, and Paul is saying, we're slipping in here. We're getting in. How? How would somebody in Caesar's household look at the, the, the flagrant luxuries of Caesar and the, the incredible arm's length of power that he has and everything and turn from that and go to Jesus. Well, he's telling you right here. He's told you before this up to the, the verses that we've covered and he's telling you right now um, or manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord becoming confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preaching in that, I do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice, for I know. Why? For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my, maybe I should, well, let's go ahead, 20. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be life or by death. Anybody get anything out of the reading of that? You don't look like you did. <laughs> All right. So he begins. <clears throat> let me just read. If we're gonna, if we're gonna make any headway, <clears throat> um, sort of a summary up to this point is um, knowing that this letter is one of Paul's prison epistles. Many assume that these particular verses are only a reference to what he, pre he is presently suffering in Ro Roman prison. However, I believe that while they do refer to that, I also believe that he's also reflecting back on the benefits which have come as a result of his prior imprisonment in Philippi, whether referring to his imprisonment in Rome or that which took place in the Philippian jail, we still have the same basic premise of selfless giving taking place so that others may gain Christ. Verse 12 starts with a bold declaration that the imprisoning of Paul has not only not hindered the gospel, but has been a means of furthering the gospel. I mean, folks, uh, a couple of us were talking uh, after class or something last week, and I was, I was telling them how when the, the uh, Black Plague covered Europe, it killed, 
you know, one third to one half of the population of the world, you know, of the known that part of the world. One third to one half of the whole population died. And every day they would have funeral. It, you know, one funeral, two, you know, three, four, five. One of the things that they did when they would march them to the grave would be they would ring this bell and people just heard the bell all day long, all night long. There was a constant dying. Family members, loved ones, friends, neighbors. Um, it was just wiping out everything and everyone. And so every, so the people who ha didn't have it when their own beloved family members would get it, they would run out of the house and leave them there because they didn't want to get it and die. If someone went to the doctor to come to their house, he wouldn't come. He wouldn't open the door. If somebody went to the priests to come and give them their last rites and, and that that world at that time was all Catholic and giving them your last rites is, you know, a big deal to them. Uh, they wouldn't do it. And so they made a little law that anybody could give them their last rites so that they didn't have to show up in the house. They amended the ways of God to protect their flesh. So, uh, you know, They've started doing mass graves and everything. <clears throat> and so everybody, of course, huge crisis. I mean, it's happening everywhere and you can't run from it. And so um, they, you know, people would go to church to try to get God's help. And after a while, they figured out God's not doing anything any different than any, any other method that they're using. So they all started turning on you know, God and the priesthood and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and uh, this is just a side note, but a bunch of weirdo religious type people sprang up that said, you know, that this is all judgment uh, for your sins and come beat yourself and do all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> anyway, um, people were saying, <clears throat> Well, if God can't help us out of this, what's the point of serving God? Okay. What's the point of serving God? If God can't help me out of this, what's the point of serving God? What kind of philosophy is that? You, you understand what I'm saying? Unless the philosophy is God's only purpose is to get you out of prison if you're thrown in prison. God's only purpose is to heal you every time you're sick. That God can't use any of that. All of that's the devil's territory. You know? Uh, we used to go down to Mardi Gras and people say, why are you going down to Mardi Gras? That's, that's where the devil is. And we go, that's why we're going down there. You know? And they go, you know. I remember when I was first born again, you know, before that, you know, you'd go to parties, you'd go anywhere, you can do all this kind of stuff, and then people say, well, you can't do that. Well, you can't do this. Well, you can't do that. And I was watching my space go shrinking, shrinking, shrinking until, well, all you can do is attend church on Sunday. You can watch these, these three movies. They're all animated. <laughs> And, and you can't listen to that kind of music. And there was a guy who was real well-known Christian singer back then, really loved the Lord. He was a Jesus freak. He wrote a song saying, why does the devil get all the good music? You know. <clears throat> and so that's what happens, see. We get reduced down. We think that this is all about um, uh, us getting certain things, us being happy, us being... So when God doesn't come through, people turn against God. All right. We were discussing this, Greg and I and a couple other people, and we said, well, what would happen if, you know, all these, you know, hurricanes and heat and, you know, uh, locusts and everything, what if, what if all of that started taking over and, and uh, those kind of plagues started happening and all of that, and people started praying to God, and God didn't change anything. 
How many people do you think would bail on God? Over half. I'm, I'm guessing 80%, but that's me, you know. But I was picturing all that when I was, I was thinking about this plague situation, and I saw our little group. And I saw us saying, you know what? God can use this. This can actually be an opportunity for God. And we're the ones who can bring that about. And I was also mentioning that there was a guy, and he was, uh, apparently he was of God. He was a doctor. And he, um, he was a doctor to the Pope. And he was studying this and all this, and he was, and, but so he kept going out and he kept going to the people, and he didn't keep himself. He was one of the only doctors who didn't keep himself from all that because he had something in his heart that he wanted to help the people. Right? And so he's around all these people who had the black plague, the, the, the number one deadliest killer in all the history of mankind just to try to put it in perspective and this guy got one thing in his heart i want to help these people my god you know and so he's trying to study this thing and he's he's writing down everything well so what happens he gets it he gets it well then you know everybody's going to come to him and go you idiot you know, we told you stay away from those people. So he gets it, goes down in the bed, goes into it real bad. But after a period of time, he comes out of it. And now he's got stuff in his veins. Anybody know what I'm talking about? He's got blood, and from that blood, he can pull it out and start helping the people. So, he, so this guy completely gives himself to death to save people from death. And what does God do? God doesn't save him from it. God allows it. But why? Why? Because if done in the right spirit, if done by Christ, if done in the right way, God takes what, what's meant for bad. You know, what did Joseph say? What man meant for bad, God meant it for good. Just because man means something for bad, just because man may be out to get you, doesn't mean God can't turn that for good. Amen? Amen. Thank God. So I'm, so I'm picturing a huge crisis, and I'm trying to picture Christianity, and I'm trying to picture us. I'm trying to see what we're made of. What do we really believe? I know what Paul believed. I know what Paul believed. And Paul proved it by the very things he's saying because he wasn't teaching a doctrine thing. See, he's writing from prison. <laughs> and we'll probably never get there, but if you get to the, the fourth chapter, but all the way through, this book, this book of Philippians is the most rejoicing. There's more joy and more rejoicing mentioned in this book than any of his others. Well, you tell me, how, how does that come about? Well, I, I left you guys and I was in prison. I'm writing to you now and I'm in prison and I don't know why God's allowing this to sound like us, doesn't it? Why is God allowing this? Why is all this turning on me? What did I do? You know? It's so full of joy because he's not in the dark. He's, these things are not in control of him. Do you, do you know what, you know? They're not in control of him. You know, somebody came to me and said, I said, how are you doing? They said, pretty good under the circumstances. I said, what are you doing under there? <laughs> you know, we're not supposed to be under the circumstances. We're supposed to be one with Jesus. We're supposed to be raised up with Jesus. We're supposed to have his life and his nature and his way and we, we, you know, perfect love casts out fear, but we don't understand what love is. So no need even trying to explain that. Because we go, well, I was loving everybody and they turned on me. Now I'm full of fear. <laughs> you know, what a 
terrible turn of events. No, no, it's exactly what Daniel experienced. They didn't just throw it, folks. They didn't just throw him in the lion's den. The other counselors that were with him got jealous of him, and they saw to it that he got thrown in the lion's den. In fact, the king didn't even want to do it. They tricked him into doing it. Well, those little weasels, that's us. That's not the Lord. Those little weasels just sit there working in the background doing all this evil stuff and oh, they just lay there on their bed and dream up new ways of tormenting me. They probably do. They probably do. In fact, I'm pretty sure they do. <laughs> and you can freak out if you're under that. But if you're a son of God by Christ, you know what your place is. You know what your job is, if you will, your occupation, your calling. Do you really see your calling, brother? <laughs> your calling. These things have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. That's what Paul said. You know, I've often said, God doesn't change. He, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? The devil's not going to change. So the only one they're looking to to change is you. That's why the enemy messes with you, to get you to change to see things from his side, to get you to see things from a fear factor. To get you under the circumstances, to get you worried, to get you fearful, to get you looking at things in, in a light that the, the Lord doesn't even go there. He doesn't even go there. He doesn't walk in the darkness in the way that we walk in it. For him, have you ever read it in the Old Testament and wondered what the heck he meant? Even the darkness is light to him. What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you exactly what it means. There is no pit too deep there's no den too full of ferocious creatures. There's no circumstances that cannot be defeated by Christ and him crucified. Now, the only difference between what I just said in that sentence and what they say on TV is they say that cannot be defeated by Christ. And I said by Christ and him crucified. Because it wasn't that God did a miracle or that God turned it. He says these things have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. In other words, I'm working hand in hand with you, Lord. I'm with you in this method. This methodology, and of course it's not a method, but I mean this is my way. And I am trying to get it into these people in Philippi. And they were birthed, you know, I just keep coming back to that. They were birthed out of it. They don't, maybe they don't know where they came from. Well, how did we get this here group in Philippi? Well, I guess God just loved us and they just set up a church. That's a church. A church. That's not how the church came. You, you hear from saints who understand. They, they say things like, the, the blood of the saints is the seeds of the church. The blood of the saints is the seeds of the church. They're sitting in Jerusalem, Peter, James, John, all of them. Jesus is risen. Now they're forming this big church and people are coming in droves. They're starting to come. Miracles are happening and all this stuff. They are having the time of their life. They are. You read it in the book of Acts. 
And God says, you're not even a little bit in tune with my spirit. My spirit is self-giving. You're sitting here gaining and reveling in all the miracles and how everybody's got everything in common and how wonderful, which, by the way, if you ever read the book of Acts and actually read it, you'll find out there was more trouble going on than joy, but that's how we read it because somebody told us that we need to get back to the book of Acts, you know. We need to have the book of Acts as our blueprint. No, Jesus is our blueprint. He was theirs in the book of Acts. Those guys are Jesus is our blueprint. Make us your blueprint now. Can you hear them saying that to us? No, they would never say that. They'd go, find Jesus as the blueprint. So they don't understand. They know not what spirit they are of yet. So they're sitting there in Jerusalem. It's growing and getting fatter and more blessed and all this stuff. So what happens? Persecution comes. Persecution comes and it's, it's, like a, it's like a bunch of marbles sitting on a table and somebody taking a ball bat and hitting it. You know, they just scattered everywhere. All over the known world. Spreading the gospel. Sharing Christ. You read it. That's where world evangelization came from. It didn't come from, you know, we will evangelize incorporated or, you know. No. Uh, the natural tendency of man is to make himself comfortable and get God to feather what he already has. Right? To feather his nest more. Lord, this is good, but, you know, and, and thank you. But there it is. There it is. I don't ask for much, just this right here. And after you give me that, I will ask for more for sure. Wow, he, he scattered them. I started to say smattered them. He scattered them all over the world. And then you start reading after that persecution. I mean, folks, how did that start? I, you know, and I'm talking about finishing the eight verses. My God, I can't even do this. But how did that start? How did that persecution start? Anybody remember? I'll tell you exactly. There was a leader, and his name was James. No, it wasn't Peter, James, and John, and James. It was the brother of Jesus, the brother of Jesus, moved up the ranks past the 12 and became the head guy that was leading the church, the James, the brother of Jesus. Now, he had to have a revelation of Christ. Don't you know that? And you can, you can read his stuff like in Acts 15. When he speaks, oh, baby, he goes to the word of God. Peter brings up something. Paul brings up something. They're talking and stuff. But when James speaks... He brings out the word in places you wouldn't even imagine. He presents the Lord in an incredible way to them. So here they all, you know, and uh, Paul talks about when he visited them and he talked with James and he talked with Peter and he called them pillars of the church. So what does God allow? He opens the door. The enemy comes in and the persecutors kill James. The head guy. Lord, we're brand new. We're barely getting off the ground here. What are you? Not him. Anybody but him. Maybe he was the only one in tune enough to make it a death that life would come out of. What do you think? Is that possible? I think it's absolutely pr probable, if not for sure, because that started the persecution that spread this around the world. <laughs> yeah, the persecution, those things happen to the furtherance of the gospel, just like you said right here in verse 12. Those things happen to the furtherance of the gospel. I don't know what verse I stopped on. I, we were just reading, weren't we? Or did we finish? Yeah, we finished. Oh, I was reading here. Um, 
Verse 12 starts with a bold declaration that the imprisoning of Paul has not only not hindered the gospel, but it's, but it's been a means of furthering the gospel. How is this so? By what means can this be so? It is clear that many ministers would see the act of being falsely accused and falsely imprisoned as a setback. Don't you think ma many ministers would? Well, it's a terrible setback. <clears throat> they would surely elicit all the people they knew to pray for release. And remember what happened to Paul in where? Philippi. He didn't even pray for it and he got it and he didn't take it. I guess he wanted a better resurrection than just him getting out of jail. When God sent an earthquake that opened the doors, they did not see it as God's miracle means of escape, but remained within their jail cell. When the jailer assumed that they had escaped, Paul stopped him from killing himself by showing that they were all yet in jail and would not use this means for personal freedom. And that's, I cannot tell you, we will find out what that little phrase right there means for personal freedom freedom. Um, consider the situation to be this. If Paul escaped, it would have saved his own life. But if Paul remained, it would not only save the jailer's physical life from being snuffed out, but would result in his salvation and that of his whole family. Now, in a Roman prison, Paul states that his present incarceration has resulted in more people getting Jesus than had, he elicited, than had he elicited God to always keep him safe from such setbacks. The, we have a choice constantly. We have a choice. The, the, in one sense, we don't have a choice. Because if you don't really, if you've just heard this and you've been around it all, you know, for years and whatever, and you don't really know it, then you don't have a choice. I'll tell you exactly what you'll do every time. You'll pray a prayer of escape. You'll pray a prayer that'll get you out of it. You will, you will. I don't care how spiritual you think you are, wait till it gets really bad and you watch what comes out. You watch what comes out. I know, I know ministers who turn their whole church around to go after Christ's life and the reality of Christ's life. And when a big crisis, a huge crisis came, folks, they, like a bucket of water, they dumped Christ's life and went right back to good old Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, because they needed a miracle. After years and after totally breaking outwardly, but never changed the heart you following what I'm saying here? You know. And see, people get mad at me because I don't get mad at such people. I just say, well, of course they did. You know, and people go, well, those people, they're traitors. They turn their back on Jesus. They didn't turn their back on Jesus. They don't know Jesus. And I don't, I'm not saying they're not saved when I say that. That's not where I'm going with that. I'm saying they don't know him in his being. They only know some religious facts, and they know what his hands can do. I'll heal you, I'll bless you, I'll break bread and give you food, I'll do all this. But they don't know the source being from which all that comes and the spirit behind every act of it being an act of death to self. They don't know that. They say they know it. They might even can be able to write a little essay on it. Well, teacher says, write me up a thing, you know, about this subject. So you write, you start, Dear Essay. Sorry. All right. Uh, all right, verse, uh, verse 13. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and all other places. Verse 13 declares how this benefit has not only reached the palace, and remember, what's the benefit? The benefit is what has come out of death, imprisonment, suffering, loss. That's the benefit that's coming to people. You know, I've often said, and I, I wish I could say something that would make a difference, but I've often said, 
You know, some, someone came to me and says, man, I don't know what the deal is. My, you know, my ship just hadn't come in yet. I said, did you send one out? Well, I didn't think of that, you know. We're waiting for resurrection, but we ain't offering up any death. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but wow. <laughs> Can I just, you know, that's why the rapture is so appealing. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly why it's so appealing. And that's why people fight you tooth and nail over it, because they don't want to die and just the thought of the hope of being able to get out of death which is completely the opposite of Christ and his way and his life and his death and his giving and, and your salvation based on totally based on that so verse 13 declares how this benefit has not only reached the palace but in all other places that's because eternal self-giving is not bound by prison walls and it is not bound by man's attempt to bring limitation. That's what Caesar was doing. Limitation. Anybody ever felt like you've been put in a very small box that you, you're so limited that, that people are limiting you? Um, at a certain juncture in my walk with the Lord, I felt like the man that was over me was just holding me in this little tiny place. I was going, let, I'm a stallion, let me run. I don't know that I thought that, but I felt it. I mean, that, if I, you know, that was it. That was a perfect description. It's like, God, you know. And I mean, I, I, I started seeing Jesus coming to a revelation of Christ in Bible school. When I graduated, they came to me and said, well, we want to send you to the mission field, not just to some big city, but in this small area way back in the bush. And there's an orphanage and a day school where you'll have to teach pub, you know, private school teaching. And I said in my mind, probably out loud to Deb or somebody. What, you know, pick someone else. <laughs> you know? And when I got there, it was, you talk about limitations. <laughs> but then the Lord started talking to me and said, this is number one. This is where I sent you. Number two, this is exactly according to my plan. Number three, if you can't be faithful in that which is least, forget me giving you more. Number four, if, you're, if your view of what I'm trying to accomplish is great things and not Christ, then you're totally messed up and out of whack with me. And he showed me Song of Solomon that he showed, you know, that she was, she was limited and he said, you know, my... Let my fragrance, I forget how it goes, but let the fragrance of it, it goes over the walls. It's not, the walls aren't holding the fragrance of Christ, but you physically can't get past those walls, can you? You're, you are limited unless you're in death. And it's just, it's just sending, the, the wind of the Holy Spirit is carrying that throughout the palace and in all places. God gave us half of what we thought we were worthy of, we would kill us and others before too long. No, we would. I, I know we, you know, but we would. We, we are irresponsible. Sorry? Yeah, and he said, Shay said, an idiot. <laughs> Faithful with that is least is simply to recognize the value of life out of death. It's simply to 
instead of trying to become a great preacher, I know people, I know people that have an incredible command of the word based on a genuine relationship with the Holy Spirit. And have shared things with me that have just blessed me and continue to bless me. And they're way younger than me. And they are in a place of limitation where they don't have a big audience, they don't have a big bunch of people coming. Just as the Lord opens the door, sends one person to their house, that's they minister life. They pour out Jesus. And they're faithful. Well, I don't know where that ends up, but I know it ends up in the furtherance of the gospel and an increase of Christ. And I think it's harder to do that than to break out like a wild stallion, which is more like a wild jackass, and run around trying to... Uh, trying to um, convince people of something that we don't have yet, you know. <clears throat> How much time we got? 45 minutes? 14 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> a little louder. The Lord forbade Israel to really have horses and stallions. So I guess he's really not into stallions breaking out. <laughs> all right. So um, the, the thing that is being manifest to all is not that Paul is an imprisoned criminal, though that is how his captors wanted him to appear. Let me tell you that some of the limitations you're experiencing right now are nothing compared to captors, or nothing compared to people who plot to destroy you and destroy your reputation and make you where nobody will listen to you. Do you believe that that could actually happen to you? To, to you, no, no, don't look at me, to you. I don't believe it can happen to me, but you maybe. <laughs> but, but what are you gonna do if that does happen? What are you gonna do if such a, such a uh, uh, horde of demonic attack is unleashed against you, against your ministry, against your word, against your integrity, against your finances, against your family, against your friends, against those that you love the most, and you appear as nothing but a reject, an outcast, a criminal, as, as Maybe even someone demon-possessed. What are you going to do? I mean, if that happens to you, I mean, if literally you, you're the target, what are you going to do? Well, I will pray, baby. I'll pray and I'll bust the, the blockade of the enemy and I will see that God be glorified. Good luck. Good luck. God will do that for them because they ain't got any better sense. You know better. God, God blesses, you know, children and retarded kids. And sorry, that's not the best political word there. And dummies. <laughs> but I got news for you. There comes a day that he expects you to grow up. And Paul is trying to help these Philippians right now because he knows that if they just continue to be receivers, this thing's going to go bad. It will. But you must become a giver. You must pour out. You must cast your bread upon the water. You must um, um, be a conduit and not just a end and means of what God's blessings have. Um, 
Let's see. So the thing that is being manifest in all is not that Paul is an imprisoned criminal, though that's what his captors want him to appear. No, the thing manifest is his bonds in Christ. He already told us in the book of Acts. Well, uh, let's keep your place in Philippians, but let's go to the book of Acts real quick. And we, because this is, this is a perfect example of a man who lives this, not just who writes it, not just who writes it or writes about it in letters to churches, but this in the book of Acts in actual situations. This is uh, Acts 21. Is that where I told you to go? Acts 21 and verse um, 10. Oh, let's start at verse 8. And the next day we were there, uh, we, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, who did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus, or Agabus. Notice we have a gathering of prophets, unlike our church. We have no prophets, <laughs> only deads. <clears throat> and when he was come unto us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this belt and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him, talking about Paul, not to go up to Jerusalem. This is from the Holy Ghost. I got the King James. I mean, I think it's got more weight. This is from the Holy Ghost, not just the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost said, this is what's going to happen. Now, what, did, what, did, what does it sound like they read into that prophecy? What does it sound like they read into it? Yes. Don't go to Jerusalem. What else? This is, this is bad. This is setback. Excellent. What else? It's a warning. Yeah, it's a warning from the Holy Spirit. Wonderful answers. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, if, yeah, Greg? Yeah, save yourself. All right. Okay. You got to know who we're talking to here, prophets. You know what I'm saying? We're talking to Paul. This guy is going to give you an answer just like Jesus always did that comes out of left field. All right? So, um, verse 12, And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Verse 13, Then Paul answered. Here's his answer. What mean ye to, to weep and to break my heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is set to suffer, to die, to be imprisoned. He, that's his modus operandi. Mode of operation. This doesn't scare him. This is, you know, anybody remember the old, old story of Burr Rabbit? Burr, Burr Fox and Burr Rabbit. And, you know, and they... He grabbed the, the rabbit and he said, I'm going to throw you in the briar patch. No, please don't throw me in the briar patch. He lives in the briar patch, the rabbit. <laughs> no, not the briar patch. No, no, no. Yes, I'm going to throw you in there. I'm going to eat you or throw you. So he's going, no, don't throw me in the briar patch. Please, don't, you know, I'm going to eat you or throw you. No, don't throw me in the briar patch. So... Or fox throws him in the briar patch. He's all, whoopee, you know. Paul is not afraid of the briar patch. Paul is not afraid of imprisonment. Paul is not afraid of having his hands bound. 
Paul is ready even unto death and is thinking that way. He's not going, avoid death, yes, yes, avoid imprisonment, yeah, 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 avoid all this stuff. God do a miracle. The prophets have spoken. Now, together, prophets, prophetesses, four daughters, pray. Oh, Lord. Paul shuts it all down and goes, you're breaking my heart with this kind of approach. Today, we'd say, you're busting my chops. <laughs> this is, don't you even know what I'm like or what I'm about or what the gospel is about or what this whole thing is pertaining to? Don't you even understand? I know it. So let's see. But for Paul, it was not just a matter of accepting God's will because... They, they're basically saying, let's see, let's, um, oh, verse 14, and when he would not be persuaded, we cease saying the will of the Lord be done. People, shame on the we there, because one of them, the main guy that's writing this, his name is Luke. The guy who wrote one of the Gospels. Dude, you need to wake up to the truth of the Gospel. And I think this helped. What do you think? I think this helped. <laughs> when he would not be persuaded, we see it saying, here we go. Religion still in place. The will of the Lord be done. The will of the Lord. See? All right, so... But for Paul, it was not just a matter of accepting God's will by resigning himself to the possibility of neg negative circumstances due to his stand for Jesus. It's not the, just a resignation to some ethereal will of the, God, of, of the gods. See, that's what it really is. Instead of, and so I said, no, instead he felt as if he were initiating God's will by means of suffering and death and loss initiating it, releasing the will of God, not just some, you know, not just a log thrown in this huge river that and being swept along and you bump into a rock and then you bump into another log and you're going in and off a cliff and, you know, well, the will of the Lord be done. Folks, the will of God pertains to Christ and Him crucified and, and, and requires our involvement. The initiating of that. Get it said quick. I know we only got a few minutes. Say it. Well, in Jeremiah, there was a couple of prophets, and Jeremiah comes in with this big yoke, like those chains, and he says, God wants us to go into death. He was really saying into bondage. And the other prophet comes in and takes the yoke and breaks it in half and goes, the will of God is that, that God's going to deliver us from this yoke, and we will not go into bondage. And all the kings go, yay! And everyone goes, kill Jeremiah. Similar in heart. Well, my last sentence before we stop here. He was, Paul was not bound by their chains, but bound to Christ and Him crucified and to the Lord's methodology. But this held him so powerfully and was so clear, was so crystal clear in his mind. He, he, he knew the way. He knew the will of God. He didn't get hung up. He didn't get, you know, when Peter came to Galatia or uh, Antioch and, you know, started, you know, having an effect on Paul, it was crystal clear to him. And he writes about it in Galatians and leads right up to Galatians 2.20 and puts everything back on Christ and him crucified. It's just so clear to him what this thing is and how to proceed. And it's, and it's, it's got to be frustrating to him that it's not clear to everyone else. And so he sets out. He sets his whole life to live by this methodology and to bring it to others by his own enacting of Christ and him crucified in his circumstances. All right, let's take a break and we'll...
come back. We actually got down to finish verse 13, so we covered two whole verses. <laughs>